Uh, today we will have uh, Gilles Penn presenting. Uh, he's an emeritus professor at Sorbonne University. And we will have, uh, thank you for being here, first of all. Uh, we will have 45 to 55 minutes presentation. And then discussants will be presenting for fi 15 minutes. And finally, we will have a uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm very pleased to, to be here among you. Uh, my, my talk is about food security, self-sufficiency, and food sovereignty. Uh, I will try to illustrate you the intertwining of these three concepts on a special case, which is the case of Réunion Island. But before doing this, I would like to give you a few number of uh, elements of historical context. By the middle of the 19th century, when abrogating corn laws, England ushered into a new area of food system globalization. It just followed the principles of uh, David Ricardo that uh, free trade is always more profitable than autarky. And thus, England just uh, delegated his food supply to his colonies and, and, and former colonies. Uh, the middle American prairie <laughs> soon became the place where a large part of wheat was grown up for feeding uh, a large part of Europe. And England just specialized into manufacturing, becoming the workshop of the world. However, the soils of the great American prairie soon become depleted of nutrients by this intensive uh, exploitation. And uh, the, the yields, the wheat yields, dropped uh, very uh, severely. Fortunately, in Deutschland, in, in Germany, uh, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch developed the process of manufacturing industrial fertilizers, and that was the the solution for uh, these decreasing yields in those over-exploited uh, soils. So this is the beginning of a second international food regime, led by the United States, mainly uh, after World War II. Uh, and the agriculture was extremely uh, modernized through a process um, excuse me, the, my, my computer is, is uh, it's very disturbing. I, I will try to stop my microphone if it's not the case. Oh, yes. I can do that. Okay, that's m more better. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, so, okay, that's where we were. So I, I just told her to do that. Uh, it's continue. Can I stop that? Ah, no. Okay. Is that okay? Oh, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, yes, this second. Uh, international food regime dominated by the United States is characterized by this process of agricultural uh, modernization, what is also called the Green Revolution. This is a process of chemicalization because of the industrial Haber Brush uh, fertilizer, which were generalized over all countries. This is also a process of mechanization, of petrolization, uh, of uh, specialization and uh, opening. And this brought us 
until the first uh, oil shock, the first oil uh, crisis and the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. At that time, uh, new neoliberal policies take over and the Keynesian uh, policies, which were the actors, the main actors of the modernization of the agriculture, these Keynesian policies were abandoned in profit of uh, liberal, full liberalization of trade and industry uh, with uh, uh, private companies taking the lead under the uh, age to the ASD, the control of uh, the uh, World Trade Organization. And today, today, in fact, more than 25% of all staple food in the world and more than 40% of fertilizer are internationally traded. This makes a, f a terrible internationalization of food supply everywhere. Yet, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century, many organizations in the Global South claimed for food sovereignty, that is for them, the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods uh, in their own countries. That's the revendication of uh, Via Campesina uh, and a large number of other organizations all over the world, but mainly the Global South. And the paradox is that after the crisis caused by the COVID epidemic and more recently uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, it was a turn of the Western countries the northern West and western countries to claim for food security and uh, food self-sufficiency, food security, that is the capacity of a country to ensure to all people uh, access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs, whatever the origin of this uh, food supply. And food self-sufficiency is the same, but with the uh, condition that uh, the food supply is mostly originated uh, through its own, through the own production of each country. And this, okay, these three concepts, food sovereignty, food security and food so sufficiency are very much uh, intertwined uh, and I will try to illustrate that on the special case of Réunion Island. Uh, Réunion Island is this small uh, island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, east of Madagascar. It's populated by nearly uh, one million inhabitants on a very small country uh, of uh, two thousand and a half kilometers square. Most of the land surface is not suitable for agriculture because it's a recent volcanic island and the available uh, the available land are occupied uh, for one third by artificialized <laughs> surfaces because of the high population density so and the, the, high, uh, pop the high area of uh, habitation and infrastructure and uh, most of the rest of the suitable agriculturally suitable land is occupied by cane monoculture these are the the, uh, the blue area the dark blue area in the uh, right part of the, the map there the, the right map there there is only a very small area devoted to orchard and market gardening and the uh, agricultural land in the highlands are mostly uh, have been mostly transformed in fact rather recently in the middle of uh, 30 years ago uh, has been transformed into grassland devoted to 
a very intensive livestock breeding activity, uh, which in fact imports most of the, uh, a large part of the feed for those animals, mostly bovines. Say these are the kind sugar cane as. Uh, yes. Now, how can we make uh, an objective analysis of the agro food system of such a territory? I know that you have few notion of agronomy for most of you, so I will be very uh, didactic. I hope to explain you. Well, for for making such an analysis, we need a common metric. This will not be euros or dollars, sorry. <laughs> this could be calories, the energetic contents of food and feed and, uh, and all these stuff. So that we could compare the energetic compare, uh, content of those things. But I prefer to use another metric, which is nitrogen. There are three reasons for that. The first reason is that nitrogen is the main constituent of proteins, and proteins is an important component of our food. And contrarily to calories, uh, proteins, the, the need for proteins in the diet is rather uniform. Whatever your activity, you know that uh, an adult uh, ordinary needs about 2,500 uh, calories per day. But it's, this depends a lot on its activity. If you are just sitting in your, your chair for, for all the, the day, you will, uh, the, this uh, 2,500 calories will be enough. If you are running all the day, the, you, you need three or four times more calories. About proteins, your need will be exactly the same, whatever your activity. And that's just because uh, proteins are just needed for renewal or your tissues and the, the basic requirement is the same and the, this requirement is about 10 uh, 60 gram of proteins that is 10 10 gram of nitrogen per capita per day that is 3.6 kilogram nitrogen per capita per year just remember this figure of 3.6 uh, kilogram nitrogen per capita per day. Now, there are uh, rich countries often consume two or, yes, up to two times this minimal requirement. And some in some countries, uh, the, this minimal requirement is hardly uh, reached. But what varies much more is in fact the proportion in this total of animal based versus uh, versus sorry versus vegetal based proteins uh, proteins are present in vegetal in, in vegetal stuff uh, for instance in cereals in grain legumes as well as in uh, animal based uh, food meat, milk, eggs, but the share of animal products is very variable according to the countries. It can vary from nearly zero, purely vegetarian uh, diet, until 70% uh, of animal-based proteins. And there is some kind of relationship with uh, the richness of the country. Here is, for instance, the historical evolution of the diet, the human diet in France, in terms of kilogram nitrogen per capita per year. You see that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the mean diet was just above the minimum recommendation of 3.6 kilogram per capita per year, with about one third, 20 to 30 percent animal proteins in the diet. And now we are above uh, nearly twice, uh, twice the total intake of proteins with a percentage of 
animal proteins, which is close to 60-65%. So that was my, my first reason to, to use, to use uh, nitrogen as a metric, because it is very much related to the needs uh, of food of people. The second reason is that nitrogen is, is also the most important limiting factor of primary production, of agricultural production in particular. Um, uh, let me explain you that in a few eggs, yes, in a few slides. Yes, uh, primary, the, the process of agriculture is just uh, making vegetables grow. That's primary production, which happens with the CO2, the carbon from the atmosphere, but the nitrogen from the soil. And the, in the biomass, the proteins made by plant primary production are coming from the soil. Now, in a forest, this production is recycled because the leaves are decomposed in the soil uh, and uh, the nitrogen can, can circulate in a closed loop which is, of course, not the case for an agricultural field because most of the biomass, not all, some unharvested residues uh, come back to the soil, but most of the biomass produced is extracted as harvest. And this extraction uh, will rapidly deplete the soil from the nitrogen and decrease the fertility of the soil. So, you always need to bring back to the soil an, an amount of nitrogen equivalent to the amount extracted by uh, harvest. And this is what we call fertilization. This can be just res by recycling of what has been extracted, and eaten and excreted. If, you, if all the excretion by animals and humans were recycled to the soil, uh, we were in a system like in a forest, except that there are a lot of losses, so you, you need some, some addition. But most of the time, the recycling of excreta is very low in agricultural system, and so you need to bring external inputs. Where are these external inputs coming from? Well, uh, there is one. Yeah, nitrogen is rather uh, rare. Uh, element in the planet, <laughs> at least under the form of reactive nitrogen. That is, this nitrogen, this mineral nitrogen, which is present in the soil under the form of uh, nitrate, ammonia, uh, and so on, uh, organic proteins, uh, things like that. These are the reactive nitrogen forms. But there is, uh, and these are rather uh, unfrequent and uh, at low concentration in the planet. But there is one huge reservoir of nitrogen, it is the atmosphere. We are, in fact, swimming in nitrogen because uh, the atmosphere, the gas in which we are living, is uh, made of 80% of nitrogen, of D-nitrogen, N2, which is a very unreactive form of nitrogen, which is not directly usable by plants. And, and that's the problem. Uh, this e inert nitrogen, which is an... Uh, enormous reservoir of nitrogen can only be uh, fixed and bring back to the biospheric cycle through two processes, two processes of, of atmospheric nitrogen fixation. The first one is a natural one. It's uh, made by uh, bacteria living in, uh, in symbiosis with some plants, the legumes, in fact legumes like uh, lentils, beans, uh, soybeans and things like that, or uh, lucerne, clover, uh, thing, alfalfa, yes, uh, that lucerne. Uh, all these plants, there are also some trees which are fixing nitrogen. All these legumes can bring some nitrogen from the atmosphere into the biospheric cycle, uh, owing to this symbiotic, uh, no, uh, this symbiosis with some bacteria. And there is another, the second process, uh, which is the one uh, discovered by Fritz Haber and uh, Karl Bosch, which consists in uh, producing hydrogen from coal or natural gas, uh, 
putting, making this hydrogen reacting with the nitrogen of the atmosphere to produce ammonia. And after that, uh, nitrate or, or, or thing like that. This process was first discovered for making explosives, but after the Second World, the, the Second World War, it was used more and more for uh, as a source of fertilizer. And now we can understand the relationship between yield and fertilization. Let me take uh, the example of one particular territory, <coughs> the Petit Terre de Burgundy, the, the, the Bur Bourgogne Plateau, south of Nevers, if you see, uh, uh, south of Auxerre, in fact, uh, in the, the western part of Burgundy. Uh, in the middle of the 20th century, those uh, agricultural lands were occupied by what we call a crop rotation. You, you know, most of the time, crops are not uh, cultivated one year, uh, each year on the same place. There is some, some succession in the same field of different uh, crops. The traditional crop succession in uh, this area was clover, the first year. Clover is a legume, so it's fixing nitrogen and bringing nitrogen in the soil, which is enough for the wheat sown after that, the second year, uh, to grow very efficiently. And then a second cereal, a little bit more, uh, le less uh, uh, demanding in terms of nitrogen, like oats, for instance, wa was grown. And the, the, the year, the, the fourth year, the cycle came back. Okay, so at the scale of this whole rotation cycle, the amount of nitrogen brought in, the, what I call the fertilization, the, the mean fertilization of the whole uh, agricultural cycle was rather low and the mean yield of these three crops was also rather low, about uh, 35 kilogram nitrogen per hectare and per year as a mean. Okay. But that was a, a rather uh, efficient way of cultivating. Today, today, the crop rotation is a little different, but it's always a tree crop rotation with rape, rapeseed, as the head of this rotation. Rapeseed, which is not fixing nitrogen and which received uh, about 200 kilogram nitrogen per year to grow. Rapeseed is used for making oil and also for making feed for uh, animals. Uh, the year after wheat is sown with a large amount of uh, chemical fertilizer and barley as a uh, second cereal uh, uh, is that. Uh, it comes after wheat. And so the inputs, the total inputs of fertilizer here is uh, about four times the amount of fertilizer brought in the traditional agriculture. And the yield is about three times as high. And we have also in this region a small number of organic farms which are not using synthetic fertilizer, which rely entirely also on the nitrogen fixation by legumes which are alfalfa or lentils, and these are much longer and diversified uh, ro crop rotation, bringing more nitrogen than the traditional agriculture, but having lower yields than the conventional uh, chemical agriculture. What is interesting is that you see that all these systems in the same territory, in the same uh, 
cl climate and pedological context show the same relationship between yield and fertilization. This is this, re this relationship, which is an hyperbolic uh, relationship, uh, is a characteristic of this pedoclimatic context. Yield depends univocally on fertilization, at least when you are speaking of average over a whole cycle of crop rotations. Okay? <laughs> so, as you see, oh yes, well, one more thing. <laughs> uh, you see the, the shape of this rotation, of, the, of this relationship. It shows that uh, the more you are putting fertilization, your more the more you, give, you, you increase the yield, but also the more you increase the losses. That is the part of the fertilization that you are bringing on the, the soil, which is not in the harvest and which is lost to the environment. Okay? And this brings me to the third reason why I like nitrogen as a metric for analyzing the agro, the, the agro systems, this, it is that the losses of nitrogen are, uh, are a very uh, perturbing uh, factor. Uh, nitrogen losses causes ecosystem perturbation, like, oh, yes, I can show you that here, uh, like uh, groundwater pollution biodiversity erosion, uh, GHG emission, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, atmospheric pollution, eutrophication. Those losses of nitrogen caused by intensive agriculture, agriculture with a fertilization rate high with respect to this relationship between yield and fertilization, uh, these losses are causing uh, serious damage to the environment. Okay, now that you understand why uh, I need, I, I use nitrogen as a metric for analyzing agro, of, uh, agro food systems, let me apply this to the case of Réunion Island. The human population with its uh, 860,000 inhabitants eats 2,000 tons of vegetal protein and 2.5 thousand tons of animal proteins. Where are these coming from? Only a very small part of the vegetal proteins are produced in the market gardening and orchard uh, systems. Cereals are hardly cultivated on the island. No rice, no maize, no wheat. Most of the cropland, as I said, is devoted to sugarcane, which is exported to, uh, to uh, Europe mostly. So most of the vegetal food has to be imported from uh, elsewhere. Concerning animal proteins, yes, there is this intensive livestock farming in the highlands, but you see that's not enough, and uh, two-thirds of the uh, diet of the human population of Réunion Island is imported. The livestock is fed, yes, on the grasslands of the islands, but that's not enough to feed the livestock. Most of their feed is imported. It's not enough. Uh, it's not the end. Uh, how is or are these grassland and these cropland fertilized? Partly with the recycling of a few parts of the wastewater, of the human wastewater, 
most of the excreta of livestock, but that's not enough. And uh, the largest part of the fertilization comes from synthetic fertilizers, which are also imported from outside. So you see that uh, this system show a very high level of dependency on imports. For imports of uh, human food, vegetal or animal, imports of uh, animal feed, and import of synthetic fertilizer. In total, for one kilogram of food provided to humans, 2.8 kilogram of nitrogen have to be imported from outside. This is the, the index I propose for measuring the dependency of the island on, uh, on imports. As you can see, this reliance on imports index, this index of reliance on of imports, increased tremendously when the synthetic fertilizer were introduced in the island in the middle of the last century, and when this, uh, this livestock farming uh, in the highlands was established uh, around the 1970s. This value of uh, an index of reliance on import of 2.8 is rather exceptional when you compare it to Mauritius, the, the, the island close to, to uh, Réunion Island, which makes much better, uh, Madagascar also, even Cuba, uh, is, and that, that's maybe obvious, less reliant on imports. We can also compare with what is the case for, for Europe. Yes, the same analysis can be for the whole of Europe. Uh, you, can see, you can see that Europe, well, Europe is also, Europe is, is exporting cereals uh, and some, some milk to the rest of the world. But Europe, as a whole, is importing large, import, la large uh, amounts of feed for, for their, the animals. And Europe is also importing a large part of uh, the synthetic fertilizer it is using. So, in fact, Europe is also depending on outside, on imports for uh, running its agro food system. Okay, uh, the situation, that, that was the situation for the whole of Europe. Now, if you make this analysis at a more uh, regionalized uh, level, you can see extreme specialization between, for instance, regions like uh, Centre Val de Loire, that, that's the region south of, of Paris, which is specialized into prote exportation of protein with an index of reliance on import of 1.6, and regions like those here, like Brit Britannia, for instance, specialize into livestock farming, uh, which imports most of the feed of the livestock uh, with uh, an index of uh, reliance on imports uh, above three. So you see that this opening of the agro-food system is not a an exception of this island of Réunion. It's general if you look at the regional uh, functioning of agro-food system today, mostly because of the specialization of these systems. So the question now is how can we change that? Are there, which, which lever can we uh, operate to reach more self-sufficiency? or said in another way, how to uh, reduce the reliance on imports. In fact, there are three levers of change. The first one is to generalize agroecological cropping system, like those I, I described you. The second is to reconnect crop and livestock farming, to despecialize, in fact, those regions 
uh, which have specialized either into f uh, several uh, production or livestock farming. Uh, and the third lever is acting on the diet. Regarding uh, long and diversified crop rotation, well, I also uh, showed you the difference between conventional chemical farming and organic farming. Uh, in, in fact, uh, across Europe, you have different types of long and diversified crop rotation, which are working pretty well and which are adapted to the climate of this, the different region in Europe, the same in Africa, in fact. Uh, the second lever, reconnecting livestock and cropping system. Well, uh, of course, if you want to despecialize the region, you have to come closer to mixed crop and livestock farming systems everywhere. Uh, so you have to stop importing uh, feed for animals. Then you have to also to uh, limit um, the industrial feed for all types of animals. There are, the all, there are two types of animals. The ruminants, like uh, uh, sheep, uh, cattle, and so on, which are eating grass, which are not in competition for food with humans. And you have the monogastrics, uh, the pigs, the poultry, which are eating grain that people can also eat. And so, uh, in this search for reconnecting livestock and cropping system, you have, in fact, to calibrate the size of the herd of these two types of animal to the locally available resources. Grass and fodder legumes for ruminants and only grain in excess of human needs for monogastrics. And that's the basis for, uh, <coughs> for reconnecting crop and livestock and for uh, reducing the need for imports. <coughs> in terms of human diet, well, clearly I showed you the long-term change in human diet in France. Uh, there, there has been a, a, a number of uh, dietitians which tried to define the most healthy and sustainable diet which could be shared to all habitants in the planet. Uh, where you know that there are lots of problems of obesity uh, besides beside malnutrition. Uh, yeah, and uh, the the healthy and sustainable di diet they proposed can be translated in terms in, of nitrogen and provides about something like this, which is in fact rather close to the French diet of the year uh, the, the end of the 19th century by chance. Uh, okay, and that that's you see, much lower in terms of total uh, protein intake, but much lower in terms of animal share in this total protein intake. So when operating these three levels at the scale of Europe and the, the whole of Europe, uh, we came to this agroecological scenario uh, this is the reference one I already showed you. This is the agroecological scenario uh, resulting from the operation of these three levers I just mentioned. As you see, uh, Europe remains an exporter, a net exporter of cereals and animal products at a level which is about half or one third of the current level. But Europe is no more importing feed from elsewhere. And Europe is no more using synthetic fertilizer. So that uh, it's 
dependency on import is much more reduced. Europe here is not only self-sufficient, but is a net exporting of all, of nitrogen as a whole. And you see also that <coughs> all these specialized region, either uh, pale yellow or of, uh, ye yellow, yellow uh, or red, have disappeared. Uh, most of Europe is again in a kind of mixed crop and livestock farming in all regions. So, would the application of these three levers be as efficient for Réunion Island, which is rather more difficult because of this extremely high population density? You, there, there is about uh, 25, 23, 25 inhabitants for each cultivated uh, hectare. Yes, you mentioned that in your <laughs> PowerPoint, I showed that. Yes, that, that's, that's very high. Huh? That's me. One hectare is not a lot, huh? uh, it's 100 meters on 100 meters. If you have to feed 25 people on that, you have to be very efficient. Would that be possible? Well, let me operate the same three lever. For not importing fertilizer, well, we have to generalize agroecological crop rotations. Agroecological uh, crop rotation is not used at all in Réunion Island today, because um, sugarcane is cultivated as a monoculture. Uh, but this was not the case in the, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, sugarcane was cultivated for three, for, for four, five, six years, and then replaced by uh, a crop of legume, beans, or uh, another f fodder legumes, and then maize was cultivated, uh, or manioc, uh, cassava, and things like that. And then again, sugar cane. But monocultivation of uh, sugar cane was not at all uh, the rule. So coming back to the, this kind of crop rotation is perfectly possible and is documented. Uh, in Réunion Island and using about 30% of grain and forage nitrogen fixing legume and 70% of non-legume like cereal or starchy roots with a small place left or not to sugar cane is perfectly possible. No imported feed, that would need, that would need yes, reconnecting crop and livestock farming by adjusting livestock size, as I said, to locally available, available feed resources for either ruminants or monogastrics. And last point, no imported food, that means a sober human diet with a strong reduction of the share of animal proteins. And we have tried different degree of reduction of the share of animal proteins. Uh, this is, yes, this is the same for France, but the, the, this is the historical reconstruction of the share of the different uh, food in the diet of Réunion Island. You see that, uh, well, the diet is aligned currently to the one of the metropole, uh, but that was at all not the case in the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century. And, okay, we tried different scenario with a decreasing, with a decreasing part of, uh, of animal products. Uh, to give you an idea of what it is, we try, yes, th this is the common <laughs> international uh, regime <laughs> uh, the, the international diet uh, with, with about 60% animal proteins. This is the components of the traditional Réunionese food with a mix of rice, uh, beans, uh, no, sorry, beans here, and uh, what is called the curry, which is uh, meat in sauce, in the spicy sauce. And 
and also uh, what they call uh, the herbs or uh, the I, I don't remember the, the Creole name for 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 those green green uh, vegetables. <laughs> okay, but so you see the plates uh, with, with a variable amount of here in this case of uh, chicken. You see the plates corresponding to 30%, 20% of 50% of animal proteins. The difference is not so high and in fact it's very tasty in all cases. <laughs> so it's not, it's not really a, a nipper sober diet. Well, when making the, uh, the calculation, we saw that full self-sufficiency can be reached with a share of animal proteins in the diet below 20%. Below 20%, it's perfectly uh, possible to reach self-sufficiency with those structural changes I mentioned. And, uh, okay, even it is possible to maintain some sugarcane production in the island. Not enough to maintain in, ac in operation the two big uh, factories that exist on the island, but enough to make some rum. Rum is a very important <laughs> product uh, in the identity of the Reunionese people. Okay, this is the scenario for 18% uh, of animal based protein in the diet. You see that there is absolutely no import of fertilizer, all comes from symbiotic fixation. There is no import of feed, there is no import of food required. So, theoretically, it is quite possible to reach food self-sufficiency in the Réunion Island. And, by the way, nitrogen losses causing so important environmental damages are reduced quite quite a lot by more than 50 percent that's the case for Reunion Island as well as for Europe in all scenarios so I didn't mention that but there exists today a strong civil society claim to food sovereignty uh, combined with a strong desire for food self-sufficiency some people some opponents says that uh, this is a dream, that this is not possible the, because of biophysical uh, uh, obstacles, mentioning the fact that 25 people on one hectare cannot be fed by this hectare. Well, this is not the case when you are making the calculation based on a completely different agronomic system. But, of course, if this is possible, it is extremely difficult, not for agronomical reason, but for uh, sociological re reason, I would say, because uh, this would require considerable structural changes in, island, in the island's economy, as well in the consumption habits. Uh, <coughs> in fact, strong locks exist, which are related to the concentration also of the decision power uh, in economy and in uh, consumption habits. Tereos, for instance, is a company which own the two factories, the two sugar factories, the two giant factories existing in the uh, island. Uh, and okay, it's, it's developing uh, an activity which involves well 10% of the of the employment in the island, but which receive enormous amounts of subsidies from from the state, from the French state. In fact, we calculated that overall, all in all, the amount of money provided to the sugar 
sugar and sugar cane industry, uh, represented 8,000 euros per hectare. If you compare that to the, the uh, subsidies for cereal in, in Europe, it, it is uh, more than uh, 10 times more. Okay, that, that's enormous. Uh, okay, but Tyrios, okay, is continuing this activity, uh, which is only viable economically because of subsidies. The same is true for, for the livestock system. The, this intensive bovine livestock system is controlled for 85% by only one cooperative, Sicarivia. And this is also true for uh, the mass distribution system. There are only three, uh, three enseignes, three firms of, of a great distribution of food shopping in La Réunion, uh, which are controlled by only two, uh, two, by only three actors, in fact. And one of them, uh, the group Bernard Hayot, is in fact controlling not only all the Carrefour enseigne, one of the third and most important uh, great uh, market in, uh, in uh, La Réunion, but is also controlling a large part of the f fast food area and is also uh, controlling the import the, tra the maritime traffic of importation, so the supply of this area. So these are the locks, in fact, to f sell food sufficiency. Not any biophysical uh, impossibility. I thank you very much for your attention.